he's no stranger to us and the energy industry in Trinidad. Our next speaker is Senator the Honorable Kevin C. Ramnarine, Minister of Energy and Energy Affairs. The Honorable Kevin Ramnarine is no stranger to the Trinidad and Tobago energy sector and the Ministry of Energy and Energy Affairs. He has previously held positions in the South Trinidad Chamber of Industry and Commerce, now the Energy Chamber, and at BGTT, where he worked as the lead economist for one of the country's most valuable natural gas assets, the East Coast Marine Area. There he obtained valuable in-depth knowledge of the workings of a multinational oil and gas company, being exposed to production sharing contracts, natural gas pricing, project economics, production optimization, business planning, opportunity screening, and determination of natural gas reserves. Minister Ramnarine has also written on and researched the Trinidad and Tobago energy sector. His research interests include Dutch disease in mineral rich countries, the political economy of oil and gas in Trinidad and Tobago, and the emergence of the gas economy in Trinidad and Tobago. He holds a BSc degree in chemistry, a MSc degree in petroleum engineering, and an international MBA. The Honorable Minister is also a member of the Society of Petroleum Engineers. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the Honorable Kevin Ramnarine. Thank you very much. Chairman of the SBE Trinidad and Tobago chapter, Mr. Brian Batiste, other distinguished persons at the head table, Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Energy, Mr. Selwyn Lashley, and Deputy Permanent Secretary, Ms. Heidi Wong, other sponsors of this SBE conference here this morning. Good morning, all. And let me first commend the SBE for another successful conference. It seems that 2012 was only yesterday um, that we were here for the 2012 conference. The team this year, of course, is future assets, acquisition, maintenance, and reliability. And this is a very relevant team to Trinidad and Tobago, and indeed very relevant to the global oil and gas fraternity. Let me say I am also very pleased that the Ministry of Energy is a titanium sponsor of this event. At the Ministry, in the last three years, the Permanent Secretary and I have always encouraged our members of staff to be involved in the SP, and I am very pleased to see that our own Ayasha Nikki is Technical Program Coordinator of the SPE. The Ministry is also very pleased to be presenting at several of the technical sessions throughout the duration of this conference, and let me just identify who some of these um, presenters would be. First here is a paper on the reintroduction of carbon dioxide supply from central to south Trinidad via pipeline, perspectives and possibilities for using the present system by Sheldon Butcher, Janine Isaac, and Carol Frontin de Pisa, all of the Ministry of Energy. There is another paper, Multi-Client Treaty Seismic Surveys in Trinidad and Tobago, towards a policy by Dr. Wanda Delandro Clark and Penny Bradshaw Niles. And then there is a paper by Ayasha Nikki, Trinidad and Tobago, diving into the deep water, but at what cost? A fourth paper is being presented by Christian Welsh, the performance characteristics of water drive gas reservoirs of the southeast coast of Trinidad and Tobago. And later today, Samir Ali, acting chief mechanical officer of the ministry, will be part of a panel to discuss asset integrity. The theme of the conference, of course, is very provoking. Future assets, acquisition, maintenance, and reliability. It speaks, of course, to the word that Keith Bali used several times in his presentation, and that is the word future. We in Trinidad and Tobago need to spend more time talking about the future and less time talking about the past. 
After three years as Minister of Energy, I can tell you that this country has a very bright industrial future. I intend today to make two major points in this speech. The first is I intend to give an idea of the future work programs for upstream, and secondly, to explore where asset integrity, maintenance, and reliability fit into that story. Turning to our upstream, and most of you all, if not all of you all in this room here, work in exploration and production. Our preliminary analysis at the Ministry shows that at the very least, we should be able to hold the 4.2 billion cubic feet per day plateau rate, and that's the national plateau rate, until 2025. And I use 2025 because that is the date in the future. showed on two occasions, and that is BP's production profile going out, I think it is into the year 2040. And it clearly shows that that thesis holds, at least for BP, that the plateau rate that the company currently produces. to 1.1 BCF per day of natural gas, and we are in the process of getting the equivalent data from EOG Resources and BHG Billiter and the other two gas producers in the country. Holding that, plat that plateau rate at 4.2 BCF per day is going to require significant investment in this country in the coming 10 years. And that investment is going to come from companies that are already here. So that investment is not going to come from companies that will suddenly enter Trinidad and Tobago and invest money and produce natural gas. The major gas suppliers in the country, of course, are here, are established, and are the ones who are best placed to take us into the future. So let's look at what has been happening with foreign direct investment in the last four years. In the year 2010, and these are figures from the Central Bank, in the year 2010, Foreign direct investment in Trinidad and Tobago was 549 million US dollars. In 2011, that went to 1831 million US dollars. In 2012, it reached an all time high of 2,453 million US dollars, or roughly 2.4 billion US dollars. And that was actually the all time high figure for foreign direct investment in this country. And last year, and this is preliminary data from the central bank, foreign direct investment was 1,713 million, that's 1.7 billion US dollars. Of course, I don't have to tell you that 90% on average of our foreign direct investment flows into the energy sector. And in the last four years, that flow has been mainly to the upstream side of the energy sector. The point is, ladies and gentlemen, is that we have seen a significant turnaround in FDI in the energy sector since 2010. And that is, of course, due to increased investor confidence, particularly coming from the incumbent players, BP, BG, BHP, and EOG. And that, too, is related to the fiscal incentives that have been provided in every budget in the last four years. In the upcoming 2014-2015 budget cycle, which is not far away, I intend to look closely at how we could incentivize the development of small stranded pools of natural gas. Because there is a significant amount of natural gas that remains um, uncommercial and hence unmonetized because it simply does not make economic sense for the companies that have the acreage in which that gas resides. In 2014, the forecasted capital expenditure for the energy sector, according to data gathered by the ministry's ERPD Energy Research Planning Division, is roughly $3.3 .3 billion. That's 2014. In 2015, and these are now Ministry of Energy figures, not central bank figures. In 2015, the figure is 
$3.2 billion, and in 2016, it is $3 billion. Significant monies will be spent in this country in the next two to three years. Most of that money is being spent, as I said, to bring oil to the surface in a safe and efficient manner. The incumbents, that is those incumbent multinational companies in Trinidad and Tobago, three years ago did not have a growth story to tell. Um, now all those companies have significant growth stories to tell. And we feel very happy about that because once those companies are growing, it means that Trinidad and Tobago's economy is in a good place. All of you all in the room here will be feeling the impact of the levels of investments that are taking place in the upstream, particularly as it relates to drilling. For example, BP in the year 2010 had a one rig drilling program in this country. That was the Constellation One Rig. At present, they have two rigs drilling in this country. Uh, one is the Rowan XL2 and the other one is the Sea Drill West Jaya. And that rig program will soon become a true rig program as a semi-submissible comes into the country to commence work on the Juniper project in 2015. In the past four years, there's also been no increase in taxes on companies in the energy sector, whether it be in the upstream, the midstream, or the downstream. This has allowed upstream companies for the first time in many years to operate in an environment of certainty. Companies like certainty. Companies do not like uncertainty. Companies do not like to have the rug pull very suddenly from under them. This comes In the past four years, we have simplified the competitive bidding process, and the results, as a result, we have signed seven deepwater production sharing contracts, five shallow average deep water, um, five shallow average depth water production sharing contracts, and we've granted a license to Petrotrin for its Trinma and North Marine acreage in the year 2012. This year, we expect to sign two more deporter production sharing contracts. That would bring the number to, total number to nine. And we expect to soon um, finalize our licenses with range resources, territorial, and lease operators coming out of the 2013 land-based bid round. There are currently 28 active production sharing contracts that the Ministry of Energy manages. And those 28 production sharing contracts are managed by our contracts management department. One of those PSCs, to give you an example, dates back to the year 1974. That's the Block 6 PSC that is currently operated by BG. Of these 28 PSCs that are active, 12 were signed in the last four years. So we have greatly increased the number of production sharing contracts that the ministry manages. At the 2000, and, as I mentioned, at the 2014 Energy Conference, I announced the award of three land blocks to Range Resources, Lease Operators, Limited, and Touchstone. These three blocks, together with the Trinma license, the seven existing deep water production sharing contracts, will lead to 31 exploration wells in the next eight years. And that is based on committed contractual obligations. And another 22 wells in the optional phases of the production sharing contracts. So that's a total of a possible, a minimum 31 exploration wells and a maximum 53 exploration wells that will be drilled in the next eight years. A significant amount of exploration activity will therefore be taking place in and around our island um, towards from now to the end of the decade. So again, looking into the future, and Keith used the word future a lot, and I like the word future. The year 2018 is a very significant year for Trinidad and Tobago's energy sector.
Next year, 2015, the BG Chevron gas sales contract with the NGC expires. So significant contracts, BG Chevron. future are about to expire and have to be renewed. At the Ministry, we don't intend to make the decisions around those contracts without the benefit of our natural gas master plan. And it is for that reason that we have commissioned such a study. And last Thursday, PS, correct me if I'm wrong, the deadline for submissions of proposals for the advertised RFP um, were submit, were, the deadline was last week to ZPS, and proposals had to be submitted to the Central Tenders Board by last Thursday. So, we as a country must collectively know what we want from the natural gas sector, and we must communicate that with the companies that produce the natural gas for the country moving forward. I would also like to stress that the energy sector, ladies and gentlemen, is not point leases, and only point leases, because I get the impression from listening to people that the energy sector is only point leases and Atlantic. And that may be because people don't see a lot of what you all do, because a lot of what you all do is not on land. It's offshore in the water. The average person in Trinidad, the average citizen, may have seen Point Lisas, and they may have seen Atlantic LNG. They may not have seen the Savonet platform. They may not have seen the Cassia hub. They may not have seen the Dolphin platform or the Hibiscus platform. And therefore, the impression may be given that the energy sector is Point Lisas and Atlantic. But without the upstream, without the work that you do, there will be no natural gas to feed Point Lisas, and there will be no natural gas to feed Atlantic LNG. So a significant chunk of the GDP that the energy sector generates, in fact, I don't have the exact figure, but the lion's share of the GDP comes from the upstream. So based on what we are seeing in the upstream, based on what Keith Bali has said, we are seeing future investments coming into the country from BP as regards the Juniper the Juniper project, and investments again from BP arising out of the very successful OBC seismic that, that that company did a few years ago. And with regard to BG, currently the company is drilling the starfish field, and there are plans for future investments in blocks 5C and block, blocks 5D. So the upstream part of the natural gas sector will be around for a very long time. But we spoke a lot about gas, so what about oil? With regard to oil production, the Petrotrin OBC seismic for Trinma and the North Marine acreage is now completed. So I could cut and I see the Vice President of ENP for Petrotrin here nodding in approval. That seismic is now completed, and as you well know, that did not come without challenges. I expect that 3D seismic that was acquired over the Trinma acreage to be a game changer for this country. And I have gone on record as saying that the energy sector is a sector where things take a while to happen. And uh, we have, with all this exploration work over the last three years, Petrotrin also in the year 2011 completed the acquisition of the largest land-based seismic program ever in Trinidad and Tobago. That was March 2011 when the, that was completed. And the processing of that data is already informing the future drilling of new prospects that have been identified. We are also seeing signs, ladies and gentlemen, of improvement from Trinma where production has averaged over 23,000 barrels of oil per day consistently for the last four months. The flagship project of Petrotrin, the Southwest Soldado project, is expected, ladies and gentlemen, to realize 
incremental production of over 6,000 barrels of oil per day by the year 2018. Again, uh, a date into the future. Range resources, Trinity, Touchstone, and Repsol as regards oil production. All this future exploration and development must, of course, as the previous speakers have said, of course, it must be underpinned by infrastructure. Safety, asset integrity, reliability, and maintenance have been dominant issues in our industry since they were highlighted by the Piper Alpha disaster in the North Sea in 1988, which caused actually the loss of 167 lives. In 1989, there was the Exxon Valdez disaster, and in March 2005, there was a Texas refinery fire, which caused the loss of 15 lives. And more recently, in 2010, there was a Macondo incident in the Gulf of Mexico, and those are four of the major um, accidents in the industry over the last 26 years. These accidents have impacted on safety policy in the energy sector globally. In April 2010, the BP Macondo oil spill was viewed by a global audience of billions. as far as safety is concerned. Safety is now the number one priority for all the multinationals operating in Trinidad and Tobago, and safety is also the number one priority for the state enterprises operating in Trinidad and Tobago. In the last three years, as a consequence of maintenance works, we have had curtailments of natural gas supply at Point Lisas and Atlantic. And that, those curtailments have, of course, caused serious concerns in the energy sector. But at the end of the day, when one assesses what was done, one would arrive at the conclusion that they were in the national interest. And they have led us to a point where our infrastructure, especially our gas producing infrastructure of the East Coast, in a, is in a much better place today than it was four years ago. So the industry is much stronger for that maintenance. And you would recall that last year, September into October, the industry underwent its largest ever coordinated maintenance program in its history. At one point in that period, September to October 2013, 25% of this country's natural gas supply was offline. The maintenance activities at that point in time involved the BP Cassia B hub, the BG Dolphin platform, Atlantic Train 3 and nine plants at the Point Lisas Industrial Estate and required a tremendous amount of coordination. So ladies and gentlemen, it is not business as usual as we move forward. And for this industry to survive and to continue to be the economic center of gravity of the country, we must focus on asset integrity, maintenance, and safety. The situation in Point of Pierre at Petrotrin's refinery is one that we must carefully consider. In the last three years, that is 2011 to 2014, 15 plants in the Point of Pierre refinery were shut down for turnarounds, many of which were long overdue for maintenance. By contrast, in the five-year period, 2005 to 2010, seven plants were shut down for turnarounds. So the frequency with which turnarounds have been taking place at Petro Petrotrin's Point of Pierre refinery um, has been greatly increased in the last four years, and that is a, as a result, of course, of the need to operate in a safe environment um, and to ensure reliability of the Refining and marketing at Petrotrin over the last three years, ladies and gentlemen, has had to play catch-up with outstanding turnarounds. Arising from this, 
several asset integrity initiatives have been developed at Petrotrin and are in various stages of implementation, all aimed at improving asset availability and reliability. New initiatives include establishment and implementation of a rolling 10-year maintenance turnaround plan for major assets, including consultant to implement the National Facilities Audit of the energy sector. This will cover all aspects of the energy sector value chain, including the downstream. I want to add, ladies and gentlemen, that the Petroleum Regulations, Section 42 of the Petroleum Regulations, under general obligations of licensees, gives the Minister of Energy the authority over licensees as it relates to the improvement of their HSC. Of Section 42 of the Petroleum Regulations would, um, would show that the Ministry has tremendous authority over the sector when it comes to the implementation of safety and best practice. So, the RFP for the consultant who will con work with the Ministry on the National Facilities Audit will be advertised in July 2014, and the recommendations from that National Facilities Audit will be implemented in the context of that Section 42 of the Petroleum Regulations. So as we progress the energy sector into the future, we are cognizant that we do so using aging infrastructure. It makes more economic sense to prolong the life of that infrastructure, of existing infrastructure, than to invest in new infrastructure. In some cases, the economics of rejuvenating mature off offshore fields only work if we prolong the life of existing infrastructure. In these cases, the project economics makes no sense if we have to install new infrastructure. So it is in the economic best interest of the energy sector to prolong the life of what we already have. Increasingly moving forward into the future will mandate that the energy sector in Trinidad and Tobago therefore invest in asset integrity and maintenance to prolong the life of these assets to ensure reliability and deliverability. This is especially important given if that the future growth in the upstream will come from a mixture of new discoveries, some of them coming from our deep water, and the rejuvenation of mature fields. So in closing, ladies and gentlemen, let me congratulate the Society of Petroleum Engineers for putting on what is another successful conference. I am aware that the Society of Petroleum Engineers operates on a voluntary basis, which is in itself amazing, um, because all the gentlemen here have full-time jobs, so that we congratulate them for their contribution to the sector above and beyond their professional day jobs. Um, this, of course, is a labor of love, and uh, organizations such as the SPE, the GSTT, the Energy Chamber, the AIPN, um, and other Um, that is much better than it would have been several years ago. So I commend the SP for the work they've been doing, not only um, at the level of the industry, but at the level of the university. Uh, because as Brian pointed out, the good news for the energy sector is that the age profile, um, which a decade ago was sort of leaning towards the older end of the spectrum, is now beginning to lean towards the younger end of the, spe of the spectrum and therefore the, the personnel to take our industry into the years tw in the 2020s, 2030s, and 2040s is certainly in the room here today. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Minister, mi, mi, uh, Minister of Energy. We close and um, proceed to the official opening. I would like to 
uh, acknowledge certain individuals and organizations who were very instrumental in making uh, this event uh, a successful one. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge the Minister of Energy.